from the first moment I, from the first appointment or session I had Dr. Magdavita, I had palpable, um, concrete relief. I mean, I think he thought I was exhausted by the time I left the first time I saw him, but I had, I felt like I had two extra cords of lung capacity because I felt stuff had been moved out of my being hmm. um, that had been there so long because we, we really started, you know, at my pre-verbal existence and um, just it what felt like uh, just tides and tides of yearning and longing and unhappiness and neglect and deprivation just poured out. Hello and welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're very pleased to devote an entire program to discussing an important method for healing trauma with the use of a therapy called EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. We're constantly reminded that we're confronting a mental health crisis in America, especially with regard to our youth. Society seems beset by mass shootings and acts of violence daily, which compound the large-scale trauma already inflicted by the pandemic. Young people in particular often lack the funds to pay for their medications or to get mental health therapy. Well, EMDR seems to offer hope to many trauma sufferers, and it has been garnering great interest for its, and credibility as an efficient and effective treatment option. EMDR was discovered in 1987 by psychologist Francine Shapiro, who found a novel method for getting people's thinking brains to work together with their emotional brains to resolve symptoms of trauma. Since then, it has provided healing to countless sufferers of PTSD and other stress-related problems, ranging from depression, chronic pain, anxiety, and addiction. What's more, it appears to be able to fast track healing in a limited number of sessions, which makes it more cost effective and within reach for countless trauma sufferers. Well, it's time to introduce today's guests. We have with us two wonderful people, an internationally renowned expert in EMDR, Dr. Debbie Korn, who has a private practice in Cambridge, Mass, and who has co-authored a new book on the subject, She's joined by Michael Baldwin, her co-author and a communications professional in New York, who credits EMDR with saving his life after decades of unsuccessful, uh, unsuccessful talk therapy. And I ought to tell you the name of the book is Every Memory Deserves Respect. Well worth reading. Okay, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, first, let's start with you, Debbie. Um, as a therapist, how did you come into this area of expertise in your career? And why were you so impressed with the efficacy and broad application of this method, which mm -hmm. seems to be able to help a, a sort of broad spectrum of um, traumatic disorders? Mm -hmm. Well, in my earliest days as a newbie therapist, while I was still in graduate school, I discovered that no matter what issues brought people into treatment? Nine out of 10 times, there was some kind of trauma beneath the surface. And I made a commitment early on to learn everything I could about treating trauma, but the field of trauma-informed treatment was still in its infancy at that time. Uh, I worked with combat veterans, with rape survivors, families of murder victims, uh, men and women who had experienced significant childhood abuse and neglect. And then in the summer of 1991, I traveled back to Denver, Colorado, where I had gone to graduate school to visit my graduate school mentor, Andy Sweet. And I was telling Andy how frustrated I was feeling with the, the limitations of the treatment models available to me when treating chronic trauma survivors. You know, in my mind, teaching patients kind of a, a raft of cognitive or behavioral co coping skills and helping them to manage symptoms seemed um, necessary, but uh, not sufficient. And more traditional talk therapy models lacked the focus and the clear path to healing that I was looking for. I was discouraged by the idea put forth 
um, in many of these models that treatment needed to be long-term, sometimes very long-term to be effective. And I was looking for something that paid more attention to the body, to the ways that trauma remained locked in the nervous system. And my mentor, Andy, said to me, Debbie, <laughs> you need to listen to me. There's this new therapy called the EMDR. It's quite unique. It sounds kind of wacky, but I'm getting remarkable results and you have to go get trained in it. So I ran and I got trained with Francine Shapiro, the developer of EMDR later that year. And about a year after that, I joined the faculty of Dr. Shapiro's EMDR Institute and started teaching EMDR and consulting to other therapists nationally and internationally. And kind of the rest is history, but I was drawn to EMDR because I wanted something that was effective and efficient and tolerable for patients. I wanted something that was um, dependable and precise. I wanted something that didn't necessarily require patients to recount the details of their traumatic experiences over and over again. And I loved that EMDR attended to emotions, the body and people's belief systems. And then it seemed to tap into people's innate healing mechanisms, the, their innate healing system. And as you said, I quickly discovered um, that EMDR could be used with many different problems, not just PTSD for which it was originally developed. No matter what symptoms people presented with, we could trace the origin of these symptoms back to earlier traumatic or adverse experiences in their life and we could get to work. But mostly though, I was drawn to EMDR because it seemed to work better and faster than anything that I had used previously. So we, we know all about PTSD it gets a lot more publicity than perhaps other forms of trauma. But let's define, if you would, for us what trauma is. And there's different types, you know, mm -hmm. small and large. So perhaps you could tell us. Sure. Well, trauma is a part of life. 70% um, of adults have experienced at least one significant trauma. Um, probably only 20% of that 70% wind up having PTSD, being diagnosed with PTSD, but 70% have experienced trauma. In our book, we define trauma as any experience that feels overwhelming, triggers strong negative emotions like shame or terror, and involves a sense of powerlessness or intense vulnerability. And I always like to say that trauma is both objective and subjective. It's both the event and the experience of the event. So no two people exposed to the same trauma are going to have the same response to that event. Um, so it's not just what happened to you, but also what happens inside of you. We also know that the greater the number of traumas the, that someone is exposed to, the greater the psychological, the physical toll. We know that trauma is cumulative and it's developmentally bound, which means that when you're exposed to trauma as a younger person, as a child or an infant, you're less equipped to deal with that trauma and you're more likely to experience the impact of that trauma in more profound ways. And when we, when we talk about trauma, we talk about big T and little t trauma. Big T traumas are the events that most anyone would consider traumatic, shock, what we might call shock traumas, where the person perceives a potential threat to their survival or the survival of loved ones. So here we're talking about childhood sexual, physical or emotional abuse, rape or physical assault, um, the traumatic death or murder of a loved one, combat related trauma, devastation related to an environmental disaster, um, witnessing violence. When we talk about little t, we're talking about the experiences that people might not necessarily recognize as traumatic or events that might not necessarily meet the official criteria for a so-called trauma, like the way trauma is defined in our diagnostic manuals. So here we're talking about uh, criticism, um, covert bullying, experiences of betrayal, experiences um, involving humiliation or failure or aloneness, subtle microaggressions, as well as blatant discrimination or hostility, related to race or ethnicity or gender or sexual orientation. You know, examples of little t traumas uh, in adulthood might be a divorce or losing a job or a difficult move or the discovery of a partner's affair. Um, examples in childhood might be 
feeling ignored or feeling different, unable to measure up or powerless to control the craziness or the, the chaos in your family. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'd want to say as we try to define trauma and the different types of trauma is that trauma involves both omission and commission. When we talk about acts of commission, we're referring to the things that happen to you right? The assault, the emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, the car accident, the traumatic loss. When we talk about omission, we're referring to situations where things were supposed to happen, but didn't. Situations where someone was not properly protected, properly listened to, cared for, or valued. So here we're talking about experience of neglect, of deprivation, uh, abandonment, alienation, invisibility. Um, so it's really important to remember that it's not the just the obvious forms of trauma, but it's these kind of invisible forms of trauma or the, these absences as well. So before we actually talk about this technique itself, why is it important to treat trauma uh, and can we heal from it like we heal from a bodily injury? Yeah. Well, you know, when people don't address, address the traumas being held in their nervous system, there can be significant psychological and physical toll. Unresolved trauma can manifest as PTSD or complex PTSD, depression or anxiety. Unresolved trauma can lead people to live in fear, to avoid places and people and things, to turn away from opportunities or relationships that, that could potentially uh, enrich their lives. When people don't recognize and address the trauma in their past or their current lives, they often wind up feeling um, not good enough, powerless, trapped. But the good news is that we can heal from trauma. The theory behind EMDR argues that the mind can heal from trauma in the same way the body heals from physical trauma. We're all physiologically geared toward the achievement of optimal health. Well, that's good news for everyone. There's there's hope. There's hope in sight. We Absolutely. don't want to depress you all. We all know we live in a very traumatic time in, in world history, uh, the history of, yeah, everything really. Um, yes. So let's now talk about this particular uh, process. Again, for people coming in, we're talking today about EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And it's a method of treating trauma, very effective method. So if I was a fly on the wall, um, Debbie, in one of your sessions, what might I expect to happen? Hmm. So first, let me just say that eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Desensitization refers to the reduction of distress or fear or anxiety. Reprocessing is kind of the reevaluation or the restructuring of thoughts and beliefs and the transformation of one's sense of self relative to the trauma. And the eye movement part, Francine Shapiro, the developer of EMDR, accidentally discovered that purposely moving your eyes horizontally back and forth while fo focusing on a traumatic memory leads to a reduction in the vividness and the emotional intensity of the memory. And she developed an effective protocol for treating PTSD and trauma-related problems using this bilateral stimulation or this back and forth eye movements and published the first research study on this approach in 1989. So hence the name eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. And it's a, a memory focused psychotherapy that helps people deal with the impact and legacy of trauma. And it's based on the idea that psychological problems are related to a failure to adequately process traumatic experiences or memories, right? So um, if you were a fly on the wall, Early sessions involve taking a thorough history and coming up with a treatment plan, establishing safety and trust within the therapeutic relationship and resourcing skill building work if needed to make sure that a client is ready to approach challenging emotional material. Um, now, most people don't show up saying, I want to work on my traumatic memories from age five or age 12. Most walk through our doors and they say, I'm miserable, I'm having trouble coping, my marriage is falling apart, I'm depressed or anxious. And we often begin with the client's current distress and we float back looking for the root of the distress. We search for relevant memories to target. Once a target memory is identified, we activate the memory through a series of questions. And then we introduce 30 to 60 
second sets of eye movements or bilateral back and forth stimulation to jumpstart and support the brain's stalled information processing system. Now, over the years, we've discovered that um, other forms of what we call bilateral stimulation are also effective in reducing distress. So uh, we might have clients track our fingers back and forth. Um, we might have them track a light that moves back and forth, or we might have them listen to headphones, alternating tones, beep, 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 or we might tap back and forth on their hands as they rest their hands in their lap. And by the way, during the pandemic, we discovered um, to great delight that EMDR can be done virtually. It's mm -hmm. quite effective when done virtually. But with every set of bilateral stimulation, the client is asked to simply notice what changes or emerges and to report what are the images, the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations, the impulses, the insights that are emerging. We encourage them to just notice, to be a passenger on a train, just watching the scenery go by. And um, we remind them to always stay connected to the present moment, just witnessing from a distance. This is not about reliving. This is about reprocessing. And we remind clients over and over, it's old stuff, just notice, just let it go by. And we, we stress the importance of what we call dual attention, right? Keeping one foot in the present at all times while accessing the past. And after every set of bilateral stimulation, we ask, what do you get now? What do you notice? What's changing? And as I said, no two people process in the same way. There's no supposed to's or shoulds. We say to clients, whatever comes up, just let it come. And Clients remember and they process. They process fear, grief, anger, guilt, and shame. We work to keep the processing body focused um, by asking questions like, well, where do you feel that? Just notice, it's just a memory. And in the course of processing, a client might imagine saying or doing what they never got to previously say or do, expressing their rage, running away, fighting back with superhuman strength, a client might also spontaneously see their younger self and offer compassion or care in their mind's eye. And with reprocessing, a client's distress eventually decreases and relevant adaptive bits of information located in other parts of the brain, helpful present day perspectives get integrated. It's over, I'm safe now. I was only a kid doing the best I could. It wasn't actually my fault. And there are shifts. There's radical shifts in thoughts, feelings, behaviors, physical sensations. Healing involves spontaneous movement toward more positive thinking and more manageable feelings and a significant reduction in the level of disturbance experienced in one's body. And final thing I'll say is that comprehensive treatment addresses past traumatic events, current triggers of and symptoms, and future behavioral goals. So we're not only working to put those old experiences on the shelf, put the past in the past, but we're neutralizing the triggers in the present, and we're helping people to face the things that they haven't been able to face in the present and set new goals for themselves moving forward. Uh, well, I'm going to talk of course, to Michael shortly, because he, he can speak first person to all these um, changes that you undergo. Um, how do these different traumas affect the brain? Uh, and how would we manifest some of the after effects? How do mm -hmm. we know we're suffering the after effects? Yeah. Well, you know, when someone is exposed to traumatic circumstances, their memories get locked or frozen in the nervous system, in our brains, right? And what that means when I say a memory gets locked or frozen, that means the images, the feelings, the sensations, the thoughts associated with that original traumatic experience get locked in the nervous system. There's somehow a breakdown in the brain's information processing system. The system <clears throat> is unable to digest, excuse me, I'm gonna pop a cough drop in my mouth, that's okay. The system is unable to digest the experience and um, other information held elsewhere and memory just doesn't get connected in. It doesn't get integrated to help a person make sense of the event. And then days later, weeks later, years later, sometimes when you get triggered, when you get exposed to a situation that somehow reminds you consciously or unconsciously of the original adverse experience, the past 
suddenly becomes the present. People lose their adult present day grounding and perspective. If all of the components of that frozen memory get triggered, it may look like PTSD, right? Flashbacks, nightmares, intrusive images, fear of situations, hypervigilance. If just the emotional component of the memory gets triggered, sadness, fear, anger, it may look like depression or anxiety or a phobia or road rage. If sensations get triggered, a racing heart or pain in the stomach or nausea, you might think that you need to see a medical doctor rather than a trauma-informed therapist. Wow, it's quite remarkable. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of people um, watching this today that probably have got physical symptoms in their body, ailments, if you wish, and that maybe have never linked them to possibly a, a suppressed problem deep in their past. And, and so I think... I'm really keen to talk to Michael about how he walked around in that state for years and tried to function. Um, so the, the great thing about this book is it is very clear and understandable, uh, not in a simplistic fashion. It's just readable and the design, it makes it very attractive and easy to take in a lot of stuff. But some of the facts in this book blew me away. One was this quote, emotional abuse and neglect carry greater weight than any than other widely recognizable forms of child abuse. So here I was, and I'm sure many others, thinking, oh, child abuse, you know, that's terrible. You inflict something upon this, this child, yet ignoring or neglecting a child can be even more harmful. That, that really um, surprised yeah. me. So um, while we're talking about that and how many damaged people are walking around, perhaps you could just reference ACES, which is this scale that's been created to kind of measure adverse childhood experiences. And mm -hmm. some of these things manifest, we know now, in illnesses mm -hmm. much later in life, physical Absolutely. illness. Yes. So trauma certainly does affect our whole well being, mental or psychological and physical. There was a very famous monumental study known as the ACEs, adverse. Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, I think it was around 1995, 96, 97, that clearly demonstrated that adverse childhood experiences are highly predictive of health and psychological problems across the lifespan. So according to this study, maltreatment, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse or neglect, and household dysfunction in childhood contribute to significant psychological issues later in life. Depression, anxiety, illicit drug use, alcoholism and alcohol abuse, suicidality, one in three diagnosed med mental health conditions in adulthood directly relate to ACEs. The longer the exposure, the greater the number of ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences, the more significant the medical and psychological impact. From this study and all of the later studies that replicated earlier findings, we know that for people with high ACE scores, high levels of trauma exposure, health issues and medical disorders can manifest decades later. So here we're talking about chronic yeah. diseases such as cancer, stroke, heart disease, COPD and diabetes among others an A score of four, which means exposure to four major events on this ACE questionnaire that was part of the study. An A score of four was associated with two times the risk of receiving a diagnosis of cancer, a fourfold increase in emphysema, and a sevenfold, 700% increase in alcoholism, which I think are staggering statistics. It really, really, truly is. The other thing that, that surprised me in the book was it said trauma is passed down from family to family. So it's intergenerational, which I just really was shocked at that. So some of us are, maybe many of us, are damaging our children unknowingly through, you know, untreated trauma, not even knowing. Is it, would, would that be true to say? Well, yes. Uh, parents who don't have the opportunity to heal 
from their own traumatic experiences run the risk of parenting in ways that wind up negatively affecting their own children, right? Parents with their own trauma histories may struggle with rage or impulsivity or depression. They might may find themselves um, parenting in the same way that their abusive or shaming or neglectful parents parented them, even though they swore that they would never do that. And because of unprocessed trauma, they may teach their children that they need to be afraid in the world and refrain from trusting anyone. So there is that risk if as parents, we don't address our own unprocessed trauma that, that we can move that trauma along to the next generation. What I think is wonderful about this is you're actually naming this because I think so few people would link those things, you know, looking at their behavior and saying, I don't know why I fly off the handle or I don't know why this happens have never probably thought that it's as a result of this deeply suppressed problem or many several problems that they had in, in childhood. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's great to, to know, A, that you can identify this and B, you can do something about it. Yeah. This is why I'm so um, delighted about that this book is, is getting read. Okay, if anyone's joining us and um, they don't know what we're talking talking about we're actually talking about emdr eye movement desensitization and reprocessing which is a form of treatment therapy uh, for treating trauma a very effective um, method and we have two people with us today dr debbie corn who is an, a practitioner in edmer and we also have michael baldwin um, who actually has been a client who has had transformative um, progress in his life through being a, a person that actually underwent this is undergoing this so michael uh welcome let's let's move over to you thank you mary so in this book you are incredibly open and um graphic really about the trauma of your childhood which masqueraded as this perfectly privileged middle class upbringing so first let me applaud your bravery in coming out with all this stuff and I think you prove that trauma affects the entire well-being, as Debbie was saying, physical and mental. So tell me, growing up, um, I don't know if you want to repeat any briefly you know, the things that happened to you. you. You may, if you wish. But how did you hide the after effects, the PTS symptoms and try to pursue what appeared to be quite a successful career in advertising? Well, um, I guess to set the stage developmentally, my trauma history, which I was aware, aware of as an adult, started with the bedrock. The, the basis really was about neglect and abuse, um, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, and um, also what Debbie refers to as attachment rupture. So I wasn't able to attach to any of my two primary caregivers, which is like being unattached in space, just floating as a child, because I had no one to turn to. I had no one to lean on. I had no one to, to be giving me what I deserved as a child. And I'm talking about pre-verbal as a starting point. Um, so that was kind of my crucible. And um, as a result, you know, I, I developed a, a conviction that I was worthless and that as I got into adulthood turned into a strategy of grandiosity. So I became a status and achievement junkie, a 24 seven workaholic. Um, and even though I as an adult would have these recurring nightmares, even though as an adult, I was dealing with phobias, even though I didn't know what the phobia is, what a phobia was. Um, I was so entrenched in this grandiosity status achievement uh, track that it was all completely eclipsed. I mean, when I had to write my story for Debbie and I was going into all that whole aspect of my life as an adult, it was exhausting the lengths to which I went. You know, running the Boston Marathon, but not walking a step, getting myself into medical school, 
and then not going. Um, being the first person to get my surname registered in 1994 as an internet domain name, um, you know, and on and on and on and monogramming anything that moved and, you know, my apartment and my car and, and, and belonging to clubs, it, it was just pervasive and exhaustive. And I look back at that person, I don't know who the person is. So in answer to your question, it was fully encompassed me and there, and because I didn't even know I was a trauma survivor to begin with, I wasn't even aware. I was just fully blinders on status achievement, junkie, grandiosity strategy. But you also suffered from things like panic attacks, right? You, you, even though you didn't know what, why, you, you had all these aspects uh, that you were kind of hiding. So when did you start going to therapy? Just because you did a lot of therapy before you found this. Yeah, again, I think for the benefit of this audience, I started in my 20s. And um, uh, by the time I uh, met Dr. Magdavita, Dr. Jeffrey Magdavita, who is my therapist, so everyone is clear, Debbie is my co-author. She was not my therapist. Um, he was the eighth therapist I saw over about 22 years. And the one consistent thing leading up to Dr. Magdavita was no therapist ever mentioned the word trauma to me ever. None of them knew anything about EMDR, including myself. Um, and uh, by the time I got to him, I was really at my nadir. I was really at, at, at the bottom. And I think uh, looking back, I think it was immediately evident to him when, when he laid eyes on me. Um, and, um, I was lucky in the, res in the respect that my sister, my older sister recommended him to me, even though I lived in New York and he was 110 miles away in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Uh, she said, are, you know, are you serious or not about getting help and healing? And then, then, you know, then it doesn't matter what the logistics are. So, um, how long ago did you discover it, EMDR? Uh, March of 2020, I believe. March 24th, I, I think it was the actual day. Funny how I remember that. Mm -hmm. So um, you seem to derive benefit quite quickly from, from the initial sessions. And first, if you could talk about that, and then as, as a part of it, perhaps you could tell us how it's improved your life and what you're left still working on. I think you repaired an abusive relationship with your brother, your older brother. Yeah, yeah, so so um, from the first moment I, from the first appointment or session I had Dr. Magdavita, I had palpable um, concrete relief. I mean, I think he thought I was exhausted by the time I left the first time I saw him, but I had, I felt like I had two extra cords of lung capacity because I felt stuff had been moved out of my being. Mm. Um, that had been there so long because we, we really started, you know, at my preverbal existence and um, just it, what felt like uh, just tides and tides of yearning and longing and unhappiness and neglect and deprivation just poured out in an experiential way, not in a verbal or intellectual way, but in an experiential way. And um, that was a consistent hallmark of every session I had with Dr. Magavita, who also, by the way, employed things other than just EMDR, although we did EMDR every time I was with him. And uh, for me, starting with the, the dismantling of this facade that had been built so, you know, fastidiously over the years, um, it basically, I guess the best way I can describe it is, my operating system prior to that was around fear and anxiety and dread and uncertainty. And the operating system I ended up when I finished with Dr. Magnavita was about waking up in the morning and just being and about having relationships with friends that were intimate and authentic. And the thing that you mentioned about my brother, who was, um, a really sadistic and brutal physical bully to me my entire growing up. I mean, relentless. 
And anyone who uh, knows about bullying knows that you live in a state of terror all the time. You never feel safe. I also had a bully at school I had to deal with. So we never had a relationship. As far as I'm concerned, we would never, until our mutual deaths, would ever have a relationship. And as a result of this work of EMDR with Dr. Mike DeVita, um, I reached out to David, letting him know the book was coming. My brother's name is David. And uh, he, he said, you can say whatever you want about me in this book. I just hope that, or the idea that we might finally be able to have a relationship as brothers brings me joy and delight. And that was um, probably a year and a half ago. We've had a Zoom call every hour, every Friday since then. Um, we had our very first week together as brothers in Vermont um, a couple of weeks ago. The Monday of the week was my brother's 70th birthday. So that's how long we waited. And it was the most remarkable experience. And he, he right now, is the most important person in my life where I never thought I'd have a relationship with this person ever in my life. Wow. Well, that's very uplifting for everybody and gives us all cause for hope, I think. So that's, that, that's really quite good. Um, I'm not going to get in because the time is ticking away. We've got questions now coming in. Um, there's a whole story about trying to get health insurance to pay for the cost of this, um, which you actually took on as a sort of a personal crusade. Why was it so important? for you to get recognition, uh, proper recognition for this treatment. Can you see, see how big it is? Yeah, a picture of you, a little picture of you. Yeah, a little picture of me. Yeah, yeah, and just here, that's, that's around about, yeah. about one. And oh, yeah. I think I'm in second grade or third grade. Yeah. And you don't see it, but there is this fear and, and panic and, and just the most horrible state of mind. So in answer to your question, I was determined on behalf of these younger parts of me to never give up and not take no for an answer because I knew I needed help and I knew that the EMDR path was the right one and I knew that in my network, it was Oscar Health at the time, they, they didn't even have an EMDR therapist. They were referring me to like herbalists and like, you know, these people who, who, who did dog training. I mean, these it, it was beyond, it was ridiculous what they were doing. And believe me, it was a challenge. It took me 13 months, but I was just not going to give up on behalf of these guys, which were me, because I wanted to be the person representing them because when I was them, there was nobody. I had nowhere to go, no one to turn to. And so I was really determined. And it was a passionate, uh, even for me, who can be very tenacious, it was a passionate, you know, long process that involved, if you read, mm -hmm. I encourage people to read it, it's only like a page and a half uh, uh, of what I went through, but it was worth it because they ended up paying 100% of my cost for Dr. Magdavita over two years. And of course, you've opened the door now for people coming through after you, which is correct, which is huge, huge. Okay, back to Debbie. Um, let's look just at what's briefly what happens in the brain when someone's exposed to trauma. So there are three parts to the brain. I think we've got a slide from the book: thinking, emotional, and instinctual. Mm -hmm. And once we see it, perhaps you could tell us the difference. There it is. Uh, right. And then, yeah, we go. Um. So as you said, it's helpful to think of the brain as being made up of three smaller brains, the thinking brain, the emotion brain, and the instinctual brain, as you see in the diagram. The thinking brain is responsible for thinking and talking, remembering, reasoning, the emotional brain responsible for feeling and remembering, detecting threat, interacting with others, and the instinctual brain is connected to sleeping, eating, breathing, et cetera. And in response to trauma, <clears throat> the emotional brain in conjunction with the instinctual brain mobilizes and winds up hijacking the thinking brain. The limbic system of the emotional brain goes into overdrive. The sympathetic nervous system automatically kicks into high gear and everything gets focused on survival. The alarms blare and the brain 
prepares you to fight or to take flight, right? Heart rate increases, pupils dilate, airways open wider. We become hyper-focused, scanning for danger, looking for escape routes, sometimes freezing when the threat feels particularly overwhelming and there's no possibility of escape. And the thinking brain's executive control network gets suppressed, cutting the thinking you, you, out of the decision-making loop. And ideally, after a trauma is over, the thinking brain is able to reestablish control. But in many cases, particularly when there's a diagnosis of PTSD, the emotional brain remains stuck in overdrive and continues to inhibit the thinking brain's functions. People remain in high alert and particularly reactive to anything that reminds them of the trauma. And the brain is not able to effectively evaluate whether someone or something is a real threat or not. Mm -hmm. And with prolonged or repeated exposure to trauma, this state of high activation, what we call hyper arousal, freeze, fight, flight, becomes chronic, leading to anxiety, difficulties with self-regulation, irritability, aggression. And sometimes when the level or the duration of stress becomes too great, a person's nervous system shifts into a shutdown or collapse mode, what we call hypoarousal. And many complex traumatic stress disorders reflect this chronic state of immobilization, right? It shows up as despair, as hopelessness, numbing, dissociation. So just like we can't expect someone with a broken leg to walk as if they were able, able-bodied, able um, we can't expect someone with a traumatized brain stuck in hyper a hypo arousal to be able to think clearly or respond effectively or function to the best of their ability. Yeah. We can no more act normally with an injured brain than we can walk normally on a broken leg. Right. Uh, that's put very nice and clearly. So um, coming back to the therapy now for a moment, how then does EMDR help people to access those memories locked in the nervous system? Well, as I explained earlier, we begin with the distress, the symptoms and the triggers in the present. And we ask clients to focus their attention on images, sensations, emotions, and thoughts. And as they attend to their body-based distress, which is not something that is typically addressed in talk therapy, we ask them to float back to a time where they experience something similar. We ask people to think about the first or the worst time. We, off, we, we often um, have people that float back to experiences that they haven't thought about in decades or incidents that they didn't really think were so pivotal. And sometimes I have people bring in photos from various times in their life and we use them to access memories. But when people are motivated, when they understand the link between these memories locked in their nervous system and the symptoms they're experiencing, when they're motivated to explore those memories and they're ready to heal, it isn't so difficult to find them. Interesting. And of course, what we're doing is rewiring the brain in a way, because you say that neurons that fire together wire together. So we want to separate or re you know, reposition the neurons and the synapses. So that's neuroplasticity. So we know the brain can do that. Yes. Right? Yes. So yes. Different outcomes, different reactions to things. Yes. Right. Neuron neurons that fire together, wire together. What this means is that we have thousands of associations that have become wired in our brain, which is mostly a good thing, right? Things that have gotten coupled together, linked. So think about it. I say roses are red and you say violets, violets are, blue. are blue. But this concept also explains how triggers become wired to tra trauma memories. As a result, every time we encounter a trigger, it activates the spontaneous replay of a memory. And that in turn, further strength strengthens the neural connection between trigger and memory. And trauma survivors grow anxious when confronted with reminders of past traumas. And over time, that fear generalizes to more and more situations. These new situations, um, they eventually create their own unique neural pathways, connecting present day people, places, and things with trauma-based fear reactions. And trauma survivors walk around with outdated problematic associations. For example, intimacy equals abuse. Love is coupled with being controlled. 
alcohol is coupled with relief. And as such, very often trauma survivors find themselves repeating patterns that they know on one level are not healthy mm -hmm. or even potentially dangerous. So returning to an abusive relationship, picking up an alcoholic drink, shutting down or remaining silent, uh, freezing like a deer in the headlights, uh, beating themselves up for not being perfect, right? All of this reflects, you know, these associations that have gotten coupled and need to get uncoupled. So we know Michael is certainly a living testimony to this effectiveness of this, this treatment. Um, what is the success rate like? And uh, of course, it's hard to measure how many sessions it takes. I mean, Michael said it happened quite quickly. He felt relief um, to get to heal because someone's written in here that is there a difference between healing and cure? We didn't use the word cure. Um, so... I just wondered, is it possible to gauge? I suppose it depends how much trauma you've had in your life. Yeah, exactly. You know, everyone wants to know how long does treatment take? And, you know, it's hard to say what the average length of treatment is for somebody working with an EMDR therapist because it depends on so many things, as you said. But early research, early EMDR research showed that 90% of adults dealing with a single episode trauma, right? A car accident, an assault, were able to eliminate or significantly reduce their PTSD symptoms in three or four sessions. And there is a research study with Bessel van der Kolk that I was involved in um, back in the early 2000s comparing EMDR to Prozac mm. in the treatment of adult PTSD. Eight sessions of EMDR compared to a comparable period of time on Prozac. EMDR was ultimately superior to Prozac in reducing both PTSD symptoms and depression. By the end of treatment, all of those in the EMDR group with adult only traumas had lost their PTSD diagnosis, right? All of those, Al along with 75% of those with childhood trauma histories. Six months later at follow-up with no additional EMDR treatment, almost 90% of the childhood abuse survivors had lost their PTSD diagnosis and a third were completely asymptomatic. We were blown away, right? So long after the EMDR treatment ended and there was no additional treatment, the brain continued to write itself. The brain continued to process and people got even better. And it's worth mentioning that um, a recent meta-analysis looking at gold standard research studies determined that not only was EMDR clinically effective, but also it's the most cost-effective of the 11 trauma therapies evaluated in the, in the treatment of adults with PTSD. And with regard to success rate, <clears throat> there are more than 44 randomized controlled trials, RCTs, demonstrating the effectiveness of EMDR for PTSD in civilian adults. So it's considered an evidence-based top tier treatment for this condition. It's strongly recommended as a treatment for PTSD in the treatment guidelines of organizations around the world, right? The World Health Organization, the US Department of Veterans Affairs, the American Psychological Association, Psychiatric Association, to name a few. Uh, and finally, in addition, evidence is mounting in support of EMDR therapy for PTSD in children and adolescents, uh, EMDR for acute PTSD reactions associated with recent trauma, mm -hmm. treatment of combat PTSD, unipolar depression, chronic pain, and complex PTSD. We're getting tons of questions coming in here, so <laughs> I don't, I'm sure, not sure we're going to get to all of them. But before we just go to the questions, Michael, in terms of your own journey here, um, you've been doing this for some time. I don't know how often you do it. What things are you still left working on? So lately, uh, this may, I don't know if this will sound corny or naive or what, but you know, why, why am I here? I am here to love and be loved. And that phenomenon has eluded me in the most um, core uh, application pretty much my whole life. And um, I look now at the relationship I have with my brother, which is as intimate as any relationship I've ever had. So in terms of what's, what's remaining, I think 
that for me is the first and final frontier where one one therapist I saw along the way said, everyone wants to be able to answer the phone and hear someone say, hi, it's me. Uh, I, I don't have that person right now, but I'm now uh, very consciously opening myself up to anything and everything. So the possibility of ending up with a person like that, a partner for me, is, is going to be a reality in my lifetime, which I think um, is probably the most important thing I can think of. Well, I think just thinking you're lovable is is the first step. Just getting to that, huge for you, right? Considering your background, um, right? So, obviously, the end game of this therapy is that you walk away in some manner healed, correct? So- yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, I always tell people that they can get better, and they will get better. Um, that I have all the confidence in the world that we can do our work together and they will heal. Um, and I say to people that my job is to make sure that they no longer need therapy, right. that they can go on with life feeling like they are at their best, right? The goal is to help people move from surviving to thriving. Okay, we got two pretty uh, um, personal questions here. One is given the potential risk of trauma due to ignoring and emotional neglect in childhood, how might the culture of boarding school, which is still prevalent in the UK Mm. and elsewhere, impact children? Mm -hmm. Mm. Interesting. Well, you know, I think um, simply sending a child off to boarding school is not problematic as long as it's not out of sight, out of mind, as as long as they're not neglected. Right. I mean, my son is away in the UK this year for college, but I'm present. He is in my heart, in my mind. I'm in touch with him regularly. I want to know how he's doing. If he is facing something that is challenging to him, he knows that he can reach out and we'll process it together and that I'm there. And I will get on a plane at the, you know, in a split second and be in London to be with him if need be. And that's the piece that matters, that there is an attachment that feels secure, that the the child or the adolescent going off to boarding school somehow is able to carry that sense of connection and knowing that they exist in the heart and the mind of their parent or their caregiver no matter where they are, no matter how far away they are, or no matter how long that is. Good point. Okay, someone else has asked, what if you have no conscious memories of the abuse, but only the symptoms, e.g. disassociation during sexual intimacy? I was able through psychodrama therapy to claim sexual freedom, but I still suffer from anxiety, feelings of dread, often waking at night with such feelings for no apparent reason. There are other ACEs that I have suffered, such as family alcoholism. So would this person, um, obviously, hopefully, be a good candidate to try another form of therapy like EMDR? Yes, absolutely. And I think Michael is a good case in point because Michael came into treatment and he was not aware of all of the traumas that occurred in his life. It's some he absolutely did not remember. And the work began with his symptoms, right? The EMDR targeted his current distress. He floated back from his current distress and paying attention to the body, paying attention to the beliefs, paying attention to the emotions that were activated in the present, he was able to access those earlier experiences. And even if experiences are pre-verbal and there's no explicit memory of those events, often, you're able to access a felt sense, a feeling in the body that can be targeted with EMDR. And perhaps you won't ever actually remember everything about what happened, but you can get relief and you can process it through the body through an affective connection to it. Uh, There's a couple of questions here, very, very different from each other, but... um... I just want to try and cram them all in. Um, One person's asking whether it can help with chronic sleep difficulty. 
And the other one says, uh, how does one know whether the actual memories elicited in EMDR are events that actually happened? This is the fake memory uh, question, of course. Right. Um, so sleep. Um, sleep is a complicated phenomenon. My husband is a cognitive neuroscientist and a sleep researcher. So we talk about sleep a lot in our household. Very, very often, though, as people go through EMDR therapy, they find that the quality of their sleep improves. They find that, you know, certainly if they're having nightmares, if they're having sleep disturbances, that subsides. You know, that's what occurred for Michael. His nightmares complete, his nightmares he had had his entire life ceased and the quality of his sleep improved. Um, you know, as your nervous system calms down, right, as we as we neutralize those unprocessed memories in the nervous system, your whole system starts to settle. As Michael was saying, his, his operating, his old operating system got switched out and he had a new operating system that was calmer, more relaxed, more grounded. So all of that can have an impact on better sleep. So that's sleep. The second question was, how do we know, right? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I, you know, we can't know. We can't know. And I always say to folks that EMDR is not a truth serum, right? It's not like a lie detector. It's not, right? We're going to work with what emerges. And together with my clients, we look at we look at what emerges and we work with it. I don't weigh in on whether this is what happened or this is exactly what happened or not. I can't possibly know that. Um, but we work with what emerges and we we're interested in results, we're interested in relief. And if processing what emerges brings relief, if it makes meaning out of symptoms, if it allows people to connect the dots and develop a site map that helps them have a framework for understanding um, many things in their lives, then we're moving in the right direction. Okay, we've got two, these I'm gonna combine, um, they're not, directly linked. Um, first, they said, thank you for sharing your expertise. What are the main protective factors against illness post-trauma? And then somebody says, is it possible to proactively use these techniques to lessen the impact of trauma? Mm. You may stump me with the last one just as we're closing, but um, <laughs> uh, protective factors after a trauma. Well, I think the most important things are the basics. When you have been through a traumatic experience, you wanna make sure that your basic needs are being met right after the trauma. So after school shootings, after you know violence in our society, making sure that people are able to feel safe again, that they understand what's happening in their bodies. They understand you know what the effects of trauma are. So education about what's happening, that they're able to, to eat and sleep and be cared for first and foremost, but then also having an opportunity to process right after that experience, talk it through, write about it, um, you know, explain to people what they experienced, right? With someone safe, someone responsive, someone who is willing to listen and validate. Those are critical factors right after. We do do EMDR right after critical incidents. We, we get right in there after a critical incident and work with people. We've got lots of protocols to do that. The last question was... Well, it's using these techniques to less proactively using them, which... Proactively. Yeah. I would say the proactive aspect of EMDR is that um, it's a, EMDR is a comprehensive treatment. So we work on past events we work on present triggers and we help people prepare for the future. So in helping them to prepare for the future, in helping them play movies of stepping into future challenging situations or even traumatic situations, carrying new beliefs, a new sense of self and seeing themselves coping effectively, we're preparing people to be more resilient in the future. Oh, developing resiliency. Yes. Very, very important. Um, Okay, this is the last. We're running a little bit over. I hope you don't mind. Um, this last question, um, there's kind of a micro application to this work. And of course, there's a macro application. And I'm quoting you now. You said EMDR helps 
individuals get better and it serves the greater good, I see my work as a form of social action, a way to contribute to ending cycles of violence in the world. So my question is, um, is EMDR being used in schools or prisons where it could really make a difference? Yeah. So yes, EMDR is being used in schools and in prisons. Um, we're addressing the effects of racial trauma in marginalized communities. Um, we're using EMDR in women's shelters and rape crisis centers. We're training therapists in third world countries in war-torn societies. Um, right this very second, in fact, uh, there is a team in the Ukraine teaching Ukrainian therapists to do EMDR therapy with their traumatized communities. Wow, that's, that's very much needed, very much yeah. needed. Okay, now I hope people will notice all the amazing links that have been posted as we've been talking, because there are lots of them. And the back of the book is full of incredible links and resources like other books. Um, there's also what would be the best website, Debbie, if someone was going to go to one website to find out more about this? To find out more about EMDR? Mm -hmm. Well, I would encourage them to go to our website, which is Every memory deserves respect, all one word, every memory deserves respect.com, the name of our book. Um, <clears throat> but I also uh, think that they can go to the EMDR Institute website. That's the institute that I'm a part of, which is just emdr.com or emdria.org, E M D R I A.org. That's the EMDR International Association. Great. That's for people that might want to try and find therapists. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Well, um, We've actually run over our time. I, uh, I'm the, the hour whizzed by. Uh, <laughs> I would really like to thank both of our really remarkable guests today, um, Dr. Debbie Korn and Michael Baldwin, who offers us all hope, help and resources by their um, testimony and their advice today. Um, Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, the Mass Cultural Council, Cambridge Community Foundation, and you. So please feel, if you'd like to donate, um, you can sign up to our members list. You don't have to pay for that. That's on the website, www.cambridgeforum.org. And you can make a donation via PayPal right there. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. So grateful. And I look forward to seeing, uh, seeing everyone again soon. Take care.